Hello everyone, welcome to Close Reading Poetry. This month I'm going through uh, lectures on the Bible and literature, and so I thought that this would be a good time to do a close reading of Henry Vaughan's beautiful poem, The Retreat. Now this makes an appearance in part one of Bible Backgrounds in English Literature, but it's also relevant for the second part of that lecture, which deals with typology. And we'll see how Vaughan uses Old Testament types to figure towards spiritual truths in this uh, beautiful poem. Henry Vaughan was a cavalier poet who actually was converted by reading George Herbert's The Temple. And so George Herbert is a very important predecessor to Vaughan. Vaughan's own devotional poetry uh, draws partly upon that mode that George Herbert introduced, this intimate and confessional voice uh, with imagery that's common to nature and to the liturgy. But Henry Vaughan does something different in many of his devotional poems, where George Herbert relies predominantly upon the Church of England, its liturgies, its festivals, its sacraments, and the Bible. Henry Vaughan goes a bit further and incorporates Neoplatonic and Hermetic philosophy, and we'll see a little bit of that popping up in the retreat. Such a beautiful poem. Let's get into it. The Retreat by Henry Vaughan. Happy those early days when I shined in my angel infancy. Uh, this is a rhyming couplet, although you may not know it because modern English doesn't quite rhyme, uh, doesn't make that rhyme, so it would have sounded like when I, angel infancy, something like that. Uh, so it would have rhymed, but we're in rhyming couplets, and we're in iambic tetrameter. An iamb is a unit of metrical foot of an unstressed followed by stressed. But you notice, and there are four of those which make it tetrameter. These are the syllables, this is unstressed, stressed. But you notice that it begins not with an iamb, but with a troche. Happy those early days when I, and it settles into iambic rhythm. This pattern of troche followed by iamb has a nice swing to it, and he'll incorporate this pattern again in the second half, or the second first paragraph of this poem. So hang on to that, but here it is. It's, it's meant not so much the swing here, but it has the effect of leaping. Happy those early days, signaling towards a sense of excitement. Happy those early days when I shined in my angel infancy. Notice that long I um, being repeated in shined in my and at the end of infancy, which we pronounce as a long E. Nevertheless, there's the metric, there's the the sense uh, he's looking back to those early days, perhaps to childhood, perhaps to something else, as we'll see. Now, still describing those early days, he says, Before I understood this place appointed for my second race, or ought my soul to fancy aught but a white celestial thought. That tetrameter just carries us along, uh, chiming with the long I's and long A's repeated here in the couplet. But this happy state, these early days, are described as a time when he did not understand this place, perhaps the world, appointed for my second race. This concept of the second race is interesting, it's obscure. According to Neoplatonic and some Hermetic philosophy, there's this idea of the pre-existence of the soul, that the human soul existed before it was placed into this uh, body into the world. Um, you'll, you'll see some poets playing with this uh, established idea. Uh, it's not really integral to Christianity. There's not, I don't think there's much in Christian scriptures that would deny the pre-existence of the soul, but at the same time it's not something that's taught formally by Orthodox Christianity, and it's not really something you find in scripture. This is something from Neoplatonic and Hermetic thought. So this second race is interesting because it, it could mean earthly race. Uh, it's connected to place both in sound and sense. St. Paul in his second letter to Timothy des describes his life. I have fought the good fight. I have run, run a good race. Race being a metaphor for, um, for life itself taken from the Greek Olympian games. Here it could mean... The second existence, or the existence in the world, in the material world. So again, that's where that hermetic philosophy is coming in. 
or taught my soul to fancy or admire or to be charmed by ought meaning anything so before he was charmed by anything except that's what's meant by but a white celestial thought and this informs i think the other kind of riddling adjective here angel infancy angel being uh, not so much a messenger or an attendant in heaven uh, here but more as a pure state uh, a pure soul existence white celestial white of course having the connotation of purity when yet I had not walked above a mile or two from my first love I'm gonna stop here this we have another biblical reference here from Revelation chapter 2 and it comes when um, John the author of the Apocalypse the revelation of Jesus Christ he is addressing the church in Ephesus he says you've done well but you have lost your first love your uh, love for God has grown cold so it's interesting that he's taking that that language from Revelation 2 he's placing it here to describe his first state when he was all soul white celestial angelic with God now and looking back at that short space could see a glimpse of his bright face. Now, I mentioned that this could be describing childhood, and I think it quite possibly is, instead of this pre-existent state. It could be that the spiritual, the white celestial angelic infancy actually has to do with literal infancy, his childhood. I think because this is so much read with Wordsworth's intimations of which imports some of the same sensibilities, that it's often taken to mean a pre-existent state, but he could just simply be speaking of childhood, which was a favored state among the Caroline poets, Thomas Traherne, Henry Vaughan, you know, a little bit of George Herbert as well. They're, they're very interested in this innocent state of childhood, but especially Traherne and especially Henry Vaughan. So he could be looking back and looking back at that short space, could see a glimpse of his bright face when on some gilded cloud or flower my gazing soul would dwell an hour and in those weaker glories spy some shadows of eternity here we have an instance of reading nature and we talked in the second lecture on the bible and literature about how the english poets read the bible and how the typological hermeneutic the way of reading types um, influence not only the way they read the Old Testament and New, but also how they read poetry and how they read what was then called the Book of Nature, God's second book. And here he's reading it. And what's he reading? He's seeing glimpses of his, my first love, implicitly God, his bright face within the gilded cloud or flower. My gazing soul would dwell an hour, and in those weaker glories spy, the things of nature being weaker diminutions, uh, shadows of the greater things, he sees shadows of eternity. Now, shadows is another typological word, a prefiguring of some spiritual or historically located event. When we're talking about the Old Testament uh, and the way that we read the Bible, shadows were things that prefigured Christ. Here, the shadows of the world, the book of nature, is prefiguring eternal truths in what is true of eternity. This is a very important way of understanding how you know, poets understood the world and how time in nature was essentially a time of devotion. And again, you know, connecting this with Wordsworth, there was a time when meadow, grove, and stream, the earth and every common sight did seem appareled in celestial light that was wordsworth wordsworth's intimations ode written in started in 1802 is not exactly derivative of this but it's certainly drawing upon the very same impulses and ideas that henry vaughn is drawing on um the pansy at my feet doth the same tale repeat whither is fled the visionary gleam so there's something that was in childhood, a visionary insight that was there that now is no more. And that's why this speaker is looking back too, just to place this in conversation with Wordsworth. You can do that with some poems, um, comparing other, other poets who are 
relying upon the same kind of ideas and concepts. Before I taught my tongue to wound my conscience with a sinful sound, or had the black art to dispense a several sin to every sense, but felt through all this fleshly dress bright shoots of everlastingness. This was a time of innocency before sin. So again, it's tapping into that prelapsarian, the Edenic, Garden of Eden imagery of this paradise lost. Something's lost. And sin brought this new awareness to the speaker, just as the transgression of God's law brought in death and sorrow and curse. This is the black art. Sin to several sins, connecting to the body, this is the condition of the body, purely, it seems. Um, but felt through this fleshly dress in those early days, bright shoots of everlasting. And shoots could be organic. It could mean like the branches of a tree or the tender herb or the grass that's just coming up. But it also could mean rays of light. So regardless, he's seeing through this. His body, when it was pure, when he was a child, was receptive and somewhat porous of this spiritual insight. Now we have a change here. Here's the turn, the second verse paragraph. Oh, how I long to travel back. Now notice the meter too is, is just like it was in the beginning. A trochee, how I long to travel back. Here's the trochee, here's the I am. And, it, and this one certainly has that swinging sense because the O is prolonged. It's, it's a long vowel, um, not like happy, which kind of skips, but this swings with the weight of emotion and of longing. Oh, how I long to travel back and tread again that ancient track. And notice how this, the pace picks up with these shorter syllables and tread again. You know, you can't help but... but but read it with this wistful energy. First delayed and prolonged, oh, how I long to travel back. And then the pace quickens there at this next line, and tread again the ancient track. And of course, perfect dynamic meter here. Um, why tread again the ancient track? That I might once more reach that plain where first I left my glorious train. Another image that Wordsworth seems to pick up in Intimation's Ode. Wordsworth's Ode is a good one to read after reading this one. Glorious train was what was followed in the fleshly dress. So it's calling back to dress. A woman's train was the long bit of dress that trailed along the, the ground. And here his fleshly dress. He's saying the glorious train have trailed along with him. And Wordsworth, you know, has that line, trailing clouds of glory do we come. Um, again, the same hermetic idea of pre-existence, but quite possibly just speaking of the angel infancy of childhood. And whence the enlightened spirit sees that shady city of palm trees. So that early state, that plain where he once was, before he left his glorious train, is where the enlightened spirit can see the shady city of palm trees, and this is how Old Testament imagery, read through the lens of Christian hermeneutics, of typology, uh, becomes just absorbed into the, the poetic structures underlying uh, English poetry. The shady city of palm trees could be referencing Jericho of the Old Testament, but it, but it most likely is referencing that that time where Moses, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, he's at the end of his life, God says, I will not allow you to go into the promised land, but I will let you see it from afar. And so he climbs up on the mount, and from the mountain he can see the promised land that the children of Israel will inherit. And from there, the shady city of palm trees. Um, again, it's it's... Evocative, that's not the only thing that this illusion is doing. It's also speaking of Eden. The idea of the Jerusalem, even, or the new Jerusalem, which is looking forward. So it's looking back and it's looking forward at the same time. And that's what that typological hermeneutic will do in these poems. But ah, my soul with too much stay is drunk and staggers in the way. He's trying to get here. He's trying to get back. 
but he's drunk with this life and the things that crowd upon this life and that weigh one down and that stupefy the mind and spirit. Um, I feel this way after too much social media, really. It's, it's kind of, you feel drunk after it. Um, you, know, you watch too many reels or something and it's just, you stagger in the way and there's something damaging to your attention. Um, but anyway, he's speaking of, of material things, of things of the world that crowd in and intoxicate the spirit. Now here's a beautiful antithesis here in this couplet. Some men a forward motion love, but I by backward steps would move. We talked about parallelism after the Hebrew mode and the Hebrew poetry, which has one idea repeated by another. Sometimes that's contrastive in that's what's called a uh, antithesis, where two ideas are uh, contrasted with each other. But here we have a pair of contrast. We have some men, forward motion, is contrasted with I and backward steps. So it's almost anti-metabolic, an anti-metaboly. And an anti-metaboly is where you have A and B, and then opposite A and opposite B put right here. Abraham Cowley has a line, God the first garden built, Cain the first city. And so God and Cain contrasted and garden and city contrasted. Um, that's just one example of that. But again, it's beautiful. It's self-contained. It's evocative. He's doing a lot with the language through conciseness here. And here he's drawing on Genesis again. Genesis 2, 19. When, uh, no, 3, 19. When God says, from dust thou came, to dust thou shalt return. And when this dust falls to the urn, in that state I came, return. So again, he's looking forward and looking back at the same time. He's in the not yet stage of the fulfillment, but he's, he, he's sure he will get back and recover that visionary insight, that angel infancy, the white celestial thought. He'll go back when his, his body dies. That's what's being discussed here. And of course, the dust um, coming from Genesis. So that's, that's Henry Vaughan's The Retreat. Henry Vaughan has so, mo so many beautiful poems. If you like George Herbert, um, you might like Henry Vaughan. Again, he's a, he's a different taste. I think, he's more, I think he's more of a poet for secular readers than George Herbert is. George Herbert is great if you are... Um, he's, he's great regardless, no matter what your spiritual sensibilities are, but his imagery is drawn from the liturgy from the Church of England. And so those who, who are familiar with those rites of the English Church or who worship according to the English Church will feel very much at home in George Herbert's verse. But Henry Vaughan has this Neoplatonic hermetic sensibility that I think is really meaningful for the contemporary experience of living as a, as a modern um, in, this, in this world today, whether you're religious or not. Again, George Herbert's great, whether you're religious or not. But Henry Vaughan has, I think, more doors into his devotional sensibility than perhaps Herbert does. Yeah, give Henry Vaughan a try. He has many poems like this. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope this was helpful, and until next time.